Hello everyone and a warm welcome to tonight's Left Book Club event. We're excited to have you here with us tonight virtually for an engaging conversation between Ron Ware and Gary Young. My name is Elif and I'm the Community and Partnerships Lead for the Left Book Club. Before we begin, let me tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do. We are a non-profit subscription book club. We specialize in publishing collectible editions of radical books that are only available to our members. Our main focus is promoting collective learning and political education, which we achieve by providing spaces for people to come together, exchange ideas and explore new ways of thinking. Our aim is to foster a sense of community to support practical step steps towards the change we all want to see. Left Book Club events have featured some phenomenal guests uh, over the last few years, so feel free to check out the video library on YouTube for discussions engaging with a wide range of radical thought. Tonight, don't forget to ask your questions to Ron or Gary on the YouTube live stream chat. And if you would like to become a member of the Left Book Club, please visit leftbookclub.com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, to keep up to date with events um, such as tonight and subscribe to our YouTube channel while you're watching. And this hasn't happened with any of our events before, but if the stream does go choppy, please, please stay with us and we'll make sure to continue running as soon as possible. So tonight we have Ron Ware in conversation with uh, Gary Young, and they will be discussing Ron Ware's uh, book called Natives. And they will be discussing the complex complexities and layered histories of the picturesque English countryside from colonial legacies to the climate crisis and how we decisively move forward to move forward towards a just and secure future. Bron Ware has been writing about racism, gender, history and national identity since the 1980s. Her books include Beyond the Pale, White Women, Racism and History, Out of Whiteness, Colour, Politics and Culture, Who Cares About Britishness and Military Migrants Fighting for Your Country. She has worked as a journalist, photographer and academic. Gary Young is a journalist, author, broadcaster and professor of sociology at the University of Manchester. He is author of several books, including his latest book, Dispatches from the Diaspora, From Nelson Mandela to Black Lives Matter. And it's a reflection on of three decades of work where Gary Young has had a ringside seat during some of the biggest events and with the most significant personalities to impact the Black diaspora. So without further ado, over to you, Gary. It never gets old, does it? The muting and unmuting. Thank you, uh, Elif, and, uh, and, and welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, here, as Elif said, to talk with Ron about her uh, uh, fabulous uh, book, Return of a Native, um, and I, I want to start in a way from where you start and finish. You you say quite close to the beginning. We cannot choose where we're born. Yet the location of our birthplace can be a determining feature of our lives. And then towards the end, the accident of my birth did not mean that I belong to this place any more than it belonged to me, but I knew there were deep ties that would tug and tear at my heart for the rest of my life. Now, what comes in between, um, for those who haven't read it, is a kind of bungee jump into the British countryside. You go, Ron goes closer and closer into, particularly the area where she uh, grew up, going through Women's Institute minutes, parish council minutes, talking to people who grew up around where she grew up, kind of um, locating herself within this area that she knows um, uh, intimately, and then coming back out and uh, looking at the history, the Crimean War, the um, uh, the proceeds from slavery that came to that area, uh, national conversations and national media that descend on the area, and then going back down in again and, and continue going in and out, zooming in and out, um, in a really um, uh, a very ev evocative and um, uh, illustrative manner. Now, Ron, I grew up in almost diametrically opposite kind of, or one would imagine diametrically opposite kind of uh, area too. I grew up in Stevenage, 
uh, a new town where they actually flattened villages in order to make the town after the um, Second World War, same year as the NHS uh, uh, was was built, um, and um, uh, and it was, you know, a very conscious, very deliberate piece of um, uh, almost social engineering, really, um, and in a range of ways that made you know uh, uh, me. Uh, so I wanted to talk about how different and how similar you would imagine where you grew up to be and how the area of, it's North Hampshire, isn't it? Um, how that helped make you. Thanks, Gary. And um, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming along. And thank you so much to Left Book Club for redoing my book, which is a huge honour and a surprise. Um, so, Gary, you have several questions sort of hidden inside your your uh, very nice intro. First thing I would say is, um, yes, we are from very different places, but actually we're not, because um, what I do is, the book is not about me, for one thing. It starts with that comment. I mean, that comment's in the first few pages about um, having been born in this place, and it ends up at the end thinking about how the places stay with you, particularly the places where you basically opened your eyes, you know, had your first sort of conscious thoughts as a child. And so I try to use that as an opportunity. You know, as you get older, you kind of think, well, I really do know this place. And because my family kept its association, then I knew a lot about it without actually living there. And of course, I didn't live there from the age of 18 to ever. And I was only going back there because my mother was there. But it just seemed like an opportunity. And uh, I tried to I tried to use it as a kind of, um, you know, like a like a, if you had a pole and you have a, a, a piece of string and you put you put it down in the ground and then you go away from it and you go round in all directions so that I can look at it from different angles. So one of the things I wanted to do was not actually go anywhere near my own home because that was too kind of contentious and difficult and too emotional actually so I went to um, the book is organized from a crossroads which is up the road from from the village where I grew up and on the crossroads there are the names of eight different places um, there's small towns there's um, my village which is perhaps the smallest there's actually another village which is owned by the owners of H&M fast food fast fashion clothing brand there's there's all kinds of stories about each place and it just seemed like an interesting place to start and to stand and to come back to so you say Stevenage is different but actually one of the places on this um signpost is is also a new town that was kind of it wasn't new town it was an expanded town but it came out of that same moment in um in in the 1940s and then was kind of engineered in the 1960s but not in a kind of interesting way like Stevenage. Uh, by the way, Stevenage is a really interesting place. If you spend like two minutes on Wikipedia, I mean, you've got the Romans, you've got the Vikings, you, you've probably got Stone Age stuff as well there. You've got um, poachers, you've got workhouses, um, and you've got uh, all these stories about its kind of different corners and different buildings. And then you've got the, it is a sort of utopian moment. You know, people are sitting around in the 40s thinking, how can we remake, how can we remake these uh, areas of population? How can we bring people out of London, which is being bombed and kind of make new spaces which are more closer to rural areas, closer to greenery? You know what I mean? All those ideas, as I understand it, were, were part of what made Stevenage, even though it isn't technically a garden city. And you also had people like, this is really interesting, you had um, um, one of the town planners, there's a woman called Monica Felton, who was kind of sacked because she, and she was against the Korean War and her political opinions obviously impinged on her, her job as a, maybe she was too radical. So once you start digging, actually anywhere, you can find these stories and they take you out into the wider world and then you find connect different kinds of connections there. Um, yes, and I almost as it came out of my mouth, you know, I grew up in a very different place. I was thinking that's almost exactly what your book 
tries to challenge really the I think among other things this kind of um uh positing of the countryside against the uh, against urban living as though they are two diametrically opposed uh things where where in fact there's quite a lot of intrusion going kind of um uh going both ways was that was that something that you always felt and felt the need to articulate or was it something that emerged through the you know through the the writing and the discovery and your kind of experience as a cultural geographer no i think i i think i always felt it and in fact um you know it's always a surprise you come you come from a village and uh, you know in the like 19 70s it's like not much to talk about really so you you go to the cities life life is much more interesting in the cities i went to live in birmingham for goodness sake um to get away from that kind of what felt like a kind of no no work no 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 culture no nothing of interest for me at that time in fact you know i didn't even want to live in this country so you sort of propelled out from this kind of small place into the world and then you start to see it you start to see actually it's been globalized and changed by the forces of, of late capitalism as much as anywhere else. And that becomes quite interesting. And the longer you think about it, the longer you go on kind of observing it, the more there is to say about that. And the more you can see the connections with somewhere else. But I mean, this is also a point about, it's not just a kind of story about a place. It's really about a kind of a way of understanding how these relationships between, you know, town and country, countryside and city, urban and rural, and all these kind of concepts that we have through which we organise our sense of, I don't know, national identity, personal identity, group identity, certainly who's who belongs, who's a native, who's who's a who's a minority, you know, who's included, who's excluded. These kind of the question of urban and rural is really important. So I guess I wanted to explore all those things and to kind of and look at the interconnections. You know, following some a lot of other people who've probably thought about these things for a long time. But if you've studied colonial history um, and the history of of the kind of post World War Two era, and looked and sort of lived through patterns of of immigration and settlement and resistance and hostility, then you start to see how those that has also shaped our idea of what happens in the countryside, what happens in cities, what happens in the rural. So one of the um, inspirations, actually, for writing the book was in the 90s. Was it the 90s? Yeah, it was in the 90s. I was teaching in Greenwich and I I was um, I just kind of stumbled on this thing, cultural geography, and, and was teaching students mainly from the southeast. And they weren't really I mean, they were they would I'd have to take them into London from Woolwich. You know, they didn't go to London very much. So we had field trips to London crossing the river. But they had an idea that rural England, like villages, was completely outside contemporary culture. Uh, and, and the idea of being modern had nothing to do with what happened in those parts of England, you know. So that was a challenge. So I think, you know, many years later, teaching in Kingston, another part of sort of the fringes of London, again, there's a sense that the students, you know, didn't really have any sort of access to these kind of places, even though they might live in suburban, on the suburbs and edges and fringes of of London in places that used to be villages. So I kind of wanted to take them by the hand and say, this is how you look at a field, you know? This is actually what a field could be, might be, we don't know, you know, scratch the surface. So that was another thing, really. I mean, throughout there is this, you see the investment from certain sections of the media and the polity to invest in this notion of remoteness of the uh, uh, almost virgin territory unspoiled um <clears throat> um sleepy village there's there's a description you give of a um uh, there's a murder nearby and the way that the um uh the way that the national press cover it as this kind of 
um, incursion from outside into the sleepy remote village, but also you have Farage coming to to a town, to one of the towns, uh, where there's going to be an asylum seekers, uh, or there's a proposal for an asylum seekers hostel, and really leveraging the notion of this kind of virgin un spoiled territory and then you have um real estate real 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 estate agents kind of selling this kind of get away from it or which you kind of you you as they have invested quite a lot of effort in creating that you invest quite a lot of kind of psychic effort in kind of unpacking what what they mean by that can you tell us a little bit about why and how you did that well <clears throat> yeah those are those are things that happened actually happened while i was writing it so say i mean i started writing the book in 98 actually 99 and for various reasons um came back to it again in 2019 2018 2019 then you just wait and things happen you know like um there's a you know a fire in the Ocado factory in the local town I didn't even know there was an Ocado factory not a factory a distribution center which happened to be state-of-the-art all um you know half run by robots which is partly why they couldn't put the fire out because humans weren't allowed in the bit where the fire was um the murder was a very distressing thing that happened in another village and that was completely fascinating because that was covered you know principally by the mail but other sort of tabloid papers and it was in August, so you know there's that, you know, much news in August, so it becomes a big thing that there's sort of horrible murder in a sleepy village. And one of the, the 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 victim's wife worked in some sort of UK space mission, so that was like immediate conspiracy. Um, and the 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 murderer who who had an accident and died um, later that same day on his motorbike, he had been known to like Nazis, sort of paraphernalia on the internet. So all the kind of you know contemporary issues were raised by it and um so it was just interesting to observe in real time how these things were being represented um so you'd have a headline describing the murder which contained the information about the average prices of houses in this particular village and at once it would you know the all the the, the price of the house belonging to the victim for goodness sake and it was just incredibly cynical because it also described the village as sleepy and all the cliches in the book. And clearly nobody went there because actually it is literally one field away from the edge of the town, which is actually growing out in that direction anyway. So it was kind of, and at the same time as that, you had the whole sort of exodus from London due to the pandemic because the, the pandemic happened in the middle of writing the book. So again, I could see the effect of that on the different sized communities, the town, the, you know, the different villages, the one, the different villages in the parish and so on. Um, and then the, the the Farage thing was, was, I mean, it made me really angry, obviously, and it was really outrageous, but, I, but watching that, what was interesting was the role of the local media. So the local media is all syndicated, you know, the sort of Southeast, Southwest, kind of different titles of papers that have share each other's news. But for some reason, the local paper, the Andover Advertiser, was going through a fairly sort of interesting phase where it also produced its own content. And in a village on the other side of the town, Andover, which was four miles away on the on the the from the crossroads, um, there was this proposal to cite an asylum seeker's um, center but in porter cabins next to very busy um, main road and obviously there's a local village that was affected and the sort of predictable um, reactions to that but that was very carefully handled by the paper so that out of um you know the comments that came up they were kind of screened so they didn't kind of do what happened in other parts of the country because i've also followed those things like in north yorkshire for example last year where people were putting up maps showing how near the primary school was to this new proposed centre, you know, really vile stuff. 
But anyway, <clears throat> the point about this one was that um, Farage came down and made his own film about this place. And he constructed it also as this little village, you know, and he went to the church and he said, oh, this was here before the Normans. You know, again, un unaffected by the invasion of the, of the foreigners coming in from outside. So all these opportunities really to kind of bring bring the world or show how the world had already come to um, this th these kind of little units. And actually, well, I think one of the things that happened was um, one of our sort of neighbours in the village who was incredibly helpful, a guy called Roly Clark, who grew up in an estate, a sort of literally a feudal estate over the hill from the crossroads. And one day he was telling me about his childhood and he was older than me, so he was a child during the 1940s. And he started saying how he, the estates, people came there who were evacuees, children who were evacuees, and then refugees came and then they met soldiers because soldiers were stationed in Hampshire um, as the war sort of continued. And he sort of said this thing on the phone. I remember him saying one night, well, we didn't really know about the world. I mean, he, he literally never went out of the estate, you know, this sort of very small community bounded by hills, actually. It was, it was um, quite a remote, even more remote place in, in terms of access. And this was like the 1930s, 1940s. He said, we didn't really know about the world. And then the world came to us. And to me, that just said everything, really, you know, about the assumptions that one can make or, what, or need to be challenged about what it is to live in, to live in a village. And and you say kind of um, they were going to open the hostel and the, the you know some of the predictable views, but there were quite a lot of unpredictable. You know there was quite a lot of compassion. I thought that people had uh, saying, look, um, actually, I mean, the, the, it seemed like the thrust of the arguments that local people were making weren't particularly nimby. It was kind of, um, we don't think that it's fair to put these people, you're going to put 500 young men here, there's nothing for them to do. It, You know, uh, somebody expressed some concern about them being near a main road when they've kind of gone through quite a lot of trauma. Uh, I mean, Farage actually kind of, under male, had to do a bit of work in order to portray some of the things that they were saying as fitting the, the script that, that they wanted, I thought. I mean, absolutely. I mean, it's not only a main road, it's the A303, which is the main road from the M3 down to Cornwall. You know, I mean, it, it it's a really important road for taking people on a holiday, for example. I mean, it's a busy, busy dual carriageway. It's the one that goes past Stonehenge, you know, ultimately when it's not a dual carriageway, when it, when it does that. But you know what I mean? It's very famous for being a, a sort of route down to the southwest. So um one of the one of the things that so that is true, and that's what I mean about there, there may have been people saying all kinds of horrendous things, but there was the real concern, and, and people always say, Oh, you know, this we're not against the asylum seekers, but this wouldn't have been fair on them. But in this case, it, it wouldn't have been. It's a sort of strange sort of area of um, there's a lot of MOD land uh, owned land around there. You know, it was a very militarized part of the country. It's not that far from Salisbury Plain, where there's one of the, you know big super garrison with lots of garrison towns and and RAF. Um, um, you know that one with begin with B. I can't remember it, but um, by which is also by the by the main road. That the um, there's, some people actually said it's the idea of there being all those men there. And yes, it's like a little chef. You know, I mean, there's nothing there. They can't even walk to it, the town. And um, but the town itself had a memory of um, the military bases near there. And they said, well, some of the women said, we remember what it was like when there were a lot of men here and it really wasn't very nice. But they were talking about, you know, men who were stationed as soldiers. So when Farage came, what, what he did was he kind of he kind of went to the village shop you know, he tried to show this sort of indigenous, endangered community. He talked to the parish chairman, parish council chairman. He went to the trout fishing place and said, oh, I remember coming here once and doing some fishing. And he found one person who had these kind of very sour, very racist views. And that's what he sort of built his video around. But actually, the guy was only a walk-on 
part for his own video. He sort of dispensed with the guy's thing. And then he started doing his thing to camera about how many people were coming in boats and stuff. So it was just a backdrop for him, really. And that was very um, that was very instructive as well. And actually, one of the one of the people, one of the councillors um, said, not only is this like a horrendous place to put people, but we have all this empty space in the town centre. You know, we have a crisis about what to do with the town centre because that's becoming empty. Nobody really wants it, even for offices. We've got to do, you know, make it um, convert it to kinds of housing. So there was a big fuss about that. And he actually became mayor, I saw subsequently. So that was pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Um so um andover uh uh well i'm not sure if it was andover that represented this or if there was something else but there is this there is this fear that occasionally you come back to of that area becoming like surrey and surrey becomes this um uh, metaphor in a way for the thing that you don't want to become or that people don't people don't want to uh, emulate and I'm wondering because I know that they don't I don't think they literally mean sorry so what sorryfication even comes up as a term which was a first for me so I'm wondering what 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 is that metaphor? What does what does Surrey mean in that in that moment? What are they what are they desperate to avoid? Well, it was a comment made on the parish council minutes. Now, the parish parish is a really fascinating kind of unit, partly because it's so historical, partly because it was exported to the British colonies, and it still um, you know exists as a as a sort of it's like a unit of the smallest unit of local government, really. Um, so somebody said there was a big, huge house. One of those big mansions had been built in the parish and there was a proposal to build something similar, to do a conversion of something similar because the parish councils, um, they discuss the planning applications. Now, one of the things about the parish council, you can look at their meetings um, and their minutes of their meetings. So you can sort of eavesdrop into these very local debates about what's going on in, in the set scale of the parish. So I wanted to kind of ground the idea of the parish so I could link that the sort of parochial, very local kind of angle to the planetary. So, so everywhere in between becomes, there are sort of strands of connection and so you don't get caught in the smallness of the parish and you don't get lost, you know, in looking out into the world and seeing these kind of world shaping events. But there is a connection. So when this guy, you know, I mean, I didn't, didn't even know this kind of mansion was there. Um, and we I drove past it one day and you could just see the kind of iron railings. This huge, great thing, massive, great thing, like a sort of country house. But it was built. I think it was only sold in 2015 or something, cost five million pounds. You think, who lives in a place like that on top of a hill, not next to anything? And I remember what it was like before and, and, and all the rest of it. But then, you know, there's a development company who's making, who's putting these kind of houses up. So there's one at the beginning of the book. And then I discover there's another one by the same company over the hill. And two different parishes have a very different relationship to, to these um, developments. Anyway, this guy said that very early on, and it seemed to encapsulate some sense of a fear of places becoming um, homogenized, becoming very similar. And the idea of Surrey is that you have these whopping great houses. It's what people used to call the stockbroker belt. <clears throat> you know, you have a huge house and not much connection to a local community, very sort of showy, and you're slightly nearer London. And, you know, if you think about it, some of the, some of the houses, um, some of the properties in Surrey owned by incredibly powerful people you know with people from from russia people from the gulf own these whopping huge great mansions i mean this is something that actually um i've come at from a different angle through through reading declassified articles you know about what what happens to the kind of the deals that are being done between arms traders and you know potentates ending up living in surrey so there is 
there is a connection there. But of course, Surrey's got really nice parts as well and really kind of, um, you know, unpopulated uh, and, and you know, it's a very internally diverse county, just as Hampshire is. So after the parish, one of the things you've got is is the county as a sort of unit as well. And I was always really interested in the idea that counties used to have their own identities, their own ways of talking, you know, their own accents and the way of looking, the way of behaving, outlook on the world. And I, you know, found old books knocking around my parents' house about Hampshire, for example, what Hampshire was like. And that seemed to me to be a really interesting and actually not that surprising phenomenon the idea that counties were different from one another, because we still think about it. You know, we think about Cornwall or we think about, you know, there's a kind of association with with a county, most counties anyway. Hampshire's a bit sort of bland. I never really was very proud of coming from Hampshire, you know. But then it's got, you've actually got the coast and you've got, you've got the bits near London, you've got all the shop, but you've also got New Forest. You know, they're very, very different. So I think the point about Surreyfication is, is really about homogenization, is about kind of, you know, people showing off their wealth, perhaps, and, uh, you know, getting away from the sort of identity that people who live in that part of Hampshire felt that they deserved, or that that's what they would bought into when they bought their properties, or maybe when they grew up. So it seemed a useful way, really, of differentiating what are, after all, you know, contiguous places and and thinking more deeply about how these environments are produced, both imaginatively as well as, you know, materially. Um, and um, just on that subject, I'm not sure if it's a homogenization exactly, but that um, we more recently um uh and you described this during the pandemic you see this kind of um this push for space from a certain kind of londoner and you mention um the words detached rural and secluded became zupla's fourth fifth and sixth most common search terms um in 2020, over 60% of homes in Seven Oaks in Kent were bought by Londoners. Uh, um, this this push, which um, I know from my own experience living in Hackney and having had several parents leave and children uh, leave, take their kids out of my daughter's school uh, mostly for the West Country, for Devon and Cornwall and so on, um, that once again, the world is, you know, if there was anybody in the countryside who said, you know, we don't get out much, well, the world the, the world is, um, is coming to them. I, I wonder if you might kind of reflect on that a bit. Yes, I mean, that's, that, that's a phenomenon that obviously happened um, sort of through the pandemic that was quite well documented that people thought, oh God, this is awful. We need to have space for, you know, our children to run around or why are we here? You know, let's have a different kind of life. So, but that's been happening on, that, that happens in phases and that's been happening for a long time. And I found this amazing report done at the turn of the century and it was, you know, there was a real fear. There was a, a mapping of where people were going and a real fear that kind of rural communities were going to be actually swamped by these people from the towns going out and kind of interfering in their sort of organic communities. You know, this is not that long ago, but it read as a sort of strange historical sort of thing from the past that um, I kind of vaguely remember. But obviously, that, as I said, there, there are waves. And if you look at it, if you look at, um, you know, questions of of land ownership, for example, and, and some of the biggest states, like the one I mentioned that Rowley lived on, and, and some of the estates near where I was writing about too, that they were kind of feudal estates and they gradually got bought, bits got bought off and sold and farmers did, you know, 
couldn't sustain the, 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 their business. They couldn't keep up with things. They couldn't make a living. Um, you know, the, pa the patterns of um, the patterns of land ownership changed in quite interesting ways throughout the 20th century and into and into the 21st. So the fact that people were sort of moving out in waves because of the idea of a, of a sort of lifestyle change, I think, I think, I think is significant. What worries me is a sense of sort of buying into a rural life or buying into the idea of a um of, of the countryside that somehow um doesn't really take into account what that means and doesn't really necessarily appreciate what is actually different about living outside a rural area. So I think a lot of people have, have perhaps regretted that the statistics seem to say that some people regretted it because of the reliance on the car, for example, you know, they don't understand how much the kind of infrastructure of, of life outside cities has declined, you know, in terms of, in terms of buses and, and and all the problems that you might have in cities around access to medical services and GPs are really compounded once you move away from those centers. There's a lot of different issues about it. On the other hand, there's a possibility for creating new forms of community, you know, of buying up old farms and living differently with other people. Um, perhaps not as much as it, as you know, because those things become very expensive real estate. Um, in the meantime, and then you have the effect on 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 local people not being able to afford houses. But then you hear people in rural areas saying, "Well, we can't live near our parents. Our children can't live near us." But you know, our children in Finsbury Park can't live near us. You know, I mean, that's happening on a on a big scale in many parts of the country. I see there's quite a lot of questions about technology, which is interesting, as well as technology and and land ownership. I mean, one of the things we haven't talked about is is farming, you know, is is the sort of story of, of food production in this country. And that's something you can start to think about just looking at the ground, you know, just looking at the ground and thinking, well, what is actually going on in this field? What is being grown in this field? And how come I don't even know what's in this field? You know, um, and I grew up here and I don't know, I can't recognise it. Well, that's not saying very much, but... Um, you know, I think I don't know whether you you found anything of interest in that story, you know, about the history of farming, particularly in the in the 19th century, actually. Hmm. As with most of the stories in in um, in the book, I felt that there was a, there was often a sense there would be something one could relate to now. And then, much like the refugees and asylum seekers, there would be some <clears throat> historical rhyming of that. Some, like, this is not the first time, you know, that, that this area or this soil... <clears throat> Has under has undergone such a kind of um, uh, revolution is the wrong word, but such a kind of such a massive shift in its um, uh, in its use. And of course, while the technology changes, the fact of technology changing is a constant, isn't it? Even if the technology now is new. The, you know, it's not the first time that there has been some kind of um, significant technological innovation that has shifted the way people understand um, um, uh, how the, you know, or their relationship to the soil. And the question is, how, how do you see the role of technology shaping society and or capital? Oh, it's a, it's a, a predictive question or capitalism in the coming years? And what challenges do you think we'll face as a result? Or what are the opportunities, what opportunities are there if we are able to democratize technology? Well, yeah, those, those are quite difficult questions. They're quite sort of big questions that take us slightly away from thinking about 
about land, but I suppose one of the one of the questions that runs through the book really is about is about food and about a relationship between land and soil and how we, you know, as a as a country produce the food that we eat. And that for me was one of the most sort of rewarding discoveries of, of following certain strands through from thinking about fertilizer, for example. You know, what, what's entailed in the development of fertilizer in order to produce certain kinds of crops and to have, you know, and what that does to our human bodies. And, you know, all those sort of stories about the 19th century, um, development in the 19th century of um, particular styles of, of food production and how imp imports from the colonies and exports to the colonies shaped diets in this country and how that could be read at a very parochial level it was an extraordinary story so so now for example we have a lot of discussion about basically how evil farming is and how destructive farming is not just intensive farming that pollutes the ground and and has all these other problems but also farming extensive farming even grass-fed beef you know you know the charge is that that is not really sustainable and that farming should be um phased out basically and food should be prepared in other ways that are more um that are that are less costly in terms of the, the ecosystems so so that those those threads of the book they don't have a kind of conclusion about yes, we should do this or no, we shouldn't. But it's like, this is something which people have to think through. And there's a lot of there's a lot of issues there about who decides and how this happens and how public opinion is shaped and who decides on behalf of whom. And as I understand it, there's a lot of, um, I mean, there are, there, are, there, are, there are people who do farming, who do food production, who are really engaged with these kind of issues. And the, the, this field where the near the signpost, for example, um, it pretty, seems pretty blank. There's not a lot of wildlife. Or so I thought. I know that at least one of the farmers who own some of the fields around this um, has been doing kind of environmental stewardship since the 90s and has been trying to, has brought, managed to bring birds back um, that were sort of almost um, extinguished in um in the sort of 60s and 70s so when you go there now you hear song larks and you hear yellow hammers and cuckoos and i was just passed through the other day and it seemed really full of life and yet there are crops in the field and it worries me when people say all farmers or people who own the land and farm have a particular attitude and a particular way of kind of treating the land that has to be terminated in order to preserve it for um, for wildlife the, the the danger is that you know one can jump to those conclusions without actually understanding the 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 histories of tending to the land and trying to to trying to um in, support life as well as produce um you know, produce um, money to make money out of it as well. And, and you know, whether or not they're producing food for people is another thing. So it's a really, really complicated area. And I think that, you know, you take your eyes off it and, and, and you kind of lose track of what is actually happening. But it's an incredibly important theme, which will take you into, you know, the whole, the whole kind of global um, politics of, sustainable food production you can't look at just a corner of england and say all oh, farming should stop now and let's have the hedgehogs back you know you've got to look at it on a sort of global level and think about where um it's not just about it's, it's the same old story you know small sm more and smaller number of big companies are controlling more and more of the world's seeds for example um areas of land, destroying huge areas of land, for example, in Brazil to produce, you know, um, cattle food or chicken food. But then you have these other stories as well um, of small farmers, sustainable farmers who are producing 70% of the world's food. So really complicated area. 
And I think we all have a responsibility to try and understand what's going on, you know, in terms of what we eat and where it comes from. But um, it's complicated. I've even personally got a sense reading your book. You say, you know, we all have a responsibility to kind of work not just that out, but a bunch of other things that I... <clears throat> Um, that I don't feel that I had necessarily taken on that responsibility particularly. It was kind of a, a lot of what you said was either either new to me or I would read, you know, I could imagine myself reading a story about a remote and sleepy village and not, and and thinking that it probably was remote and sleepy, not thinking particularly critically. Um, <clears throat> and in that sense, if I am indicative of others, is there some way in which the kind of rural England has been either kind of neglected or traduced even po politically by those who might care for it in a certain way, but by progressives, I mean. Um, I mean, we know it's evoked and leveraged as the unspoiled and so on that, you know, I've spoken about before. Um, <clears throat> and I know that it is embraced in terms of environmentalism, but there is so much m more to it than that, which comes out in your book, which I, to be honest, had not really given much thought to before I read your book. But I mean, can I ask you, when you were growing up, did your parents try and grow food? Um, <clears throat> yeah, my, my we had, um, interestingly, given that it was Stephen Inch, we, we had a few chickens um, and a chicken coop. And then um, my mum would episodically, and this was really about time, she would episodically be growing uh, vegetables in the back garden. But a lot of people had allotments, um, so the allo allotment culture was a was a big thing. Well, I I thought you'd, I thought you'd probably say that. I mean that's in, that's incredibly important, and actually the history of that people trying to grow food in you know more urban settings is is really um, interesting and important as well, because if you think about it, you know when most people lived outside the big big towns, that's what people were doing. They were growing their own food, and then as that sort of proportion changed in the mid you know eighteen fifties. And so there was an equal number of people in towns and sort of, you know, people were displaced basically from, from where they lived and had some kind of sense of, of being able to grow their food uh, or have access to that kind of food into cities where they were dependent on what, you know, I mean, how do you get food in a sort of industrial city? How do you, where do you get your food from? Where do you get your vitamins? You know, there's huge issues there about malnutrition. Um, and then again, the allotment movement, I think was partly certainly kind of given a big boost by people after the First World War who were sort of moving into the cities who really wanted to grow their own food. Um, I, I mean, it used to really bother me for thinking like when I first started this project in, in the um, sort of 1999-ish, 2000, it's like, why do people make these such radically different decisions about where to live? You know, it couldn't be more different actually living somewhere where there are no street lights. It's really quiet. There are very few people. You, you kind of know everybody's name. All living in, you know, in the middle of, middle of, I don't know, London, different parts of London. Why would, it's so different experience. Why would, why do people make those decisions? What's it based on? I don't have an answer, but um, uh, I forget where exactly I was going with that particular, particular thing, but it was, it was, thinking about you and your relationship to like, you wouldn't have really thought about these things before. I guess that's what I'm trying to get at because there's this sort of sense now people write about um, 
nature, they write about the countryside in a way that actually a lot of the time slightly bothers me that it kind of objectifies this thing called nature. It sort of traps it in a slightly ahistorical way. It idealizes what we think we call nature and it happens outside a kind of social um, uh, environment, a built environment, or else it's sort of manufactured, you know, in a park or something. So how do we actually understand nature and where is, what's our human relationship to nature? So a lot of that is being really kind of turned over by by sort of explosion of publishing about uh, people's experiences of going to different parts of, of this country, you know, let alone different parts of the world, and writing about how that makes them feel um, and how the need to go into nature, which is something else that came out of the pandemic. You know, we need to be close to nature. We need to, um, to have freedom to to you know, be in a green place, it's good for our mental health. Uh, these things are very current. And I think that the, the trespass movement, the right to roam is really important and really significant. A lot of people are feeling now more and more sort of um, strongly about being able to just get out and go away and wander around and, and have access to these kind of places which are, you know, good for us. So I suppose... I think that's all fantastic and wonderful, but it bothers me that um, there was another question really about um, the idea of identity and belonging, and it sort of slightly relates to Elif. Um, if you don't mind me saying this, Elif, you sort of misquoted my title of my book as Natives, and actually explaining why it's called Return of a Native. Um, is something that's quite important because that's such a loaded word. So the idea of certain people belong in those places, certain people have a kind of greater ability to think about being in nature or to explore in, in, in you know, parts of the country where, um, where it's possible that actually it's not equal for everyone. It's not the same for everyone. It depends a lot on who you are, what you look like and how you feel, whether you feel like you might be seen as an outsider um, whether people might be hostile, whether it might be dangerous. And of course, there's been a lot of work on that, a lot of thinking about that particular problem. Um, and I kind of wanted to really push at that, push at some of the assumptions that, again, that these places are somehow out of time with the kind of modern cosmopolitan world, that they're um, automatically going to be suspicious, hostile, dangerous, which obviously sometimes they are, and that people can't find a sense of peace in terms of um, accessing them and um, in, the, in the same way that other people who look like they might be uh, more at home. So I think that um, that's one of the things I really wanted to, to kind of be part of those discussions. And I know we're sort of coming to an end. So just getting back quickly to the idea of, of native, it refers really to what I said at the beginning about using that um, familiarity with a place, particularly where I was born. So in that sense, technically a native, because I was born there, a native of that parish. But using that familiarity to try and, and open it up and to explore it, not as someone who necessarily knows it very well, but actually as someone who is almost in exile, who kind of comes back and looks at it with new eyes that there isn't a claim that because I was a native, I can actually fit there, belong there, know it better. Actually, that's actually not the case. I don't feel like I belong there or kind of would happily settle back there. It's not, that would not be my choice anyway. But it's not, that being a native, um, again, is, a, is, a, is an opportunity to think about that relationship to a place rather than to make an assumption about sort of belonging there somehow um that's not that's not very clear because i've got my eye on the clock and there are things pinging up on the chat thing but but i think at the end of the book i basically say that my parents who lived there i mean my mum was 97 when she died and she lived there you know since she was in her late 20s she wasn't a native of that place you know and at the end, she really didn't feel at home. And that was kind of tragic because she'd made a home there, but she didn't feel like that. 
because she had dementia and she I don't know where she thought she was, but she didn't feel she was at home. So again, it wanted to trouble the idea of what we meant by native and how you can be a native and you can bring stuff from the place you were born and flourish somewhere else and put down roots. That goes without saying. It's just the sense of, of opportunity of having uh, a sense of connection to somewhere. And, you know, like the saying, you can never go home again. Well, you, you can, you can go home lots of times. It looks different every time you go back. You know, and again, that's an opportunity to be creative with that. How are we doing? Thank you very much for that, Ron and Gary. I mean, this the com this conversation has been really interesting for me. Well, I'm sure for everyone who has been uh, watching tonight, but also for me personally, um, I think in terms of also apologies for the misquote. I wrote it as a <laughs> note on my. I took it down as a quick note and then forgot to actually say the full <laughs> title. Um, but I think you know what what native what native means and belonging and place and home and so on. I think you know a lot of many migrant uh, and diaspora communities have these conversations and that almost you know framework and discussion being extended to um, what you what your book explores, uh, Ron. I think is um, has been you know very very interesting um for for me to hear in that you know i think m people from a lot of migrant communities don't imagine that non like migrants or non international migrants feel like they might not belong i think yeah i think it's an interesting exchange um so thank you very much for that and thank you gary for um your masterful chairing and um conversation skills <laughs> and thank you everyone everyone for tuning in um tonight and being a part of this conversation and just as a very quick reminder if you want to become a member of the left book club please visit leftbookclub.com and follow us on twitter instagram and facebook and see you at the next one thank you